little bit different um, and take a huge step back um, and talk about a few things that we've learned that are very, very foundational to where we've gotten in terms of our modicum of success. Um, and also talk a little bit about, these are the things that I think if I were gonna start another company or as we continue to scale are extremely important. Um, I'm gonna get pretty personal in some, some situations here. Uh, I'm gonna reveal some, some cool data, so be gentle. Um, but I'm also gonna say some things that are offensive, um, you know, just in terms of the data, not violating code of conduct, I promise. Um, but it's one of those things where my goal is to make you think. Um, so if you have like a visceral reaction to some of the things we talk about, Obviously, let me know. I'm going to share my email at the end, and I want to share and make sure that you get the value from what we're talking about. Sound good? You guys fired up? All right. If you're not fired up, I'm not fired up, and it's all about me, right? No, I'm just kidding. All right, cool. So the first thing we're going to talk about, this whole concept of finding leverage within our business, the whole idea of you have limited time, limited resources, all these limitations no matter where you are in your business and you're trying to scale that business. So how do you find the right leverage to understand how you should grow? The next thing we're gonna get into is seeking truth, um, something that isn't quite as binary as a lot of us want it to be um, and how it comes sometimes gets extremely gray and how we can act within that gray and that chaos. And then finally, controlling fear. Um, all of you, if you're not a sociopath, have some fear when you're building your business and some fear that basically creeps in in terms of all the external stimuli that you have. Um, and I've had some pretty unique problems with my business and so have some learnings there. Um, first off, to give a little background, who here has heard of ProfitWell or Price Intelligently? Okay, cool, that's awesome. I think if I said that last time I spoke, everyone was like, who the fuck is this guy? But um, that's really cool. So I'm gonna go really briefly through this then. Um, so ProfitWell, our core product is free subscription financial metrics. So we plug into Stripe, Zora, Braintree, whatever you're using and give you access to basically your churn data, your metrics, all that kind of fun stuff, some good segmentation. We also have engagement data in the platform. And we give this away for free. I'll go a little bit deeper into why, but we give it into, away for free on a very briefly basis here, mainly because what we're trying to do is we're trying to show you problems and opportunities within your business. And then we want to sell you software that basically helps those problems and helps those opportunities. And so the paid products that we have, we have a product called ProfitWell Retain, and I stole all of this from our marketing site because I'm a terrible designer, so sorry if it's coming off a little pitchy, that's not what I'm trying to do here. Um, it handles delinquent churn and now voluntary churn is in beta as well. We have a product that does revenue recognition, which is like terrible, but really important. Um, and then finally we have Price Intelligently, which is software that basically helps you understand where you should be pricing and how you should be pricing. Um, and the whole vision here is basically we want to sit at the center of basically the subscription universe in order to study it, understand the truth of subscription growth, and then build products that basically take that understanding and help companies grow in a very like outcome-based way. Um, to give you some numbers, we haven't revealed any of this before, so that's kind of cool. Um, one big metric that we track for the free side um, is revenue under management. Um, and so this is the ARR of every company that's on ProfitWell. It's about five billion, which is pretty cool. Um, it's actually really accelerating to 2019, which is also really cool. Um, we also, in terms of revenue, this is what the past two and a half years look like. I'm gonna show you what it looks like kind of across the seven years in a bit. It's one of those classic zeros and then it works out. Um, so we just crossed the 10 million mark, which is cool. And you can kind of see, turns out when you hire a marketing team in 2018, all of a sudden it starts to work, which was really kind of fascinating. Um, yeah, who would have thunk, right? Um, we got 65 people right now. Um, most of those are in Boston. We have a Rosario, Argentina office as well, which is about 10. Um, that office is continuing to expand. About half of the 65 are in R&D and in product. Um, we have 78% gross margin. Um, a lot of people think we're a consulting business on the price intelligently side. It's, we're not, it's a software company with professional services, which is a little bit different. Um, and then we've had zero dollars in funding, um, which is pretty cool. Um, it's not entirely true though. Um, the funding actually came from myself. And so you're looking at, and these are not fun numbers, um, you're looking at my salary over time, as well as my savings over time. Um, and basically in 2012, um, I started my career working in US intelligence in DC, not a high paying job. Um, then I went and worked at Google, which was like not really a high paying job, but a really, really good um, job. And so I'd saved up, you know, with my 401k and my savings about $25,000. Um, basically that went to zero very quickly within 2012 and 2013. 
And then I basically paid myself an average of about $30,000 up until the last couple of years um, when I'm finally making six figures. Um, I also paid with flesh. And what I mean by that is this is what I looked like in 2012. Um, I'm the one on the right, to be super clear. Um, <laughs> and now I look like this. So um, that's exciting, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the background, a little bit about the company, some facts you might not have known about us. But what I want to do is I first want to get into leverage. Because I was thinking about, in 2019 planning in particular, what has gotten us to this point and what has gotten us through some of the hardest times that we've faced. And I think that we luckily, and I don't think we knew this proactively, but we luckily got into a position where we knew how to exploit the little resources that we had, and we were really, really good at using that restriction as expression in terms of growth and what we built. And when I talk about leverage, what I'm really trying to get at is we want to get the most out of our time, our money, and ultimately the effort. Now, what's interesting is in our communities, we live in this world of a lot of different dichotomies. And what I mean by that is when you look at people giving you advice on what you should do, there seems to be one side of the world that's like, do things that don't scale, right? Paul Graham tells us, you know what, in your early days, but even in like your growth phase, you got to do things that don't scale. And he and the rest of the group that says that is not wrong. They're not necessarily right. But then you have this other side of the group, particularly a lot of engineers, data scientists like myself, et cetera, who say, you know what, you got to work smarter, not harder, right? We've heard these two things before, yes? Raise your hands if you have. There we go, audience participation. It gives me joy, OK? So we've heard these two things. But the really, really funny thing is, is that none of the, neither of these two things are right 100% of the time, right? Neither of them are really right most of the time. Most of the time, you can have things that don't scale that are actually really, really good and absolutely OK, but you can also have things that tank your entire business, right? And what I found in kind of like reflecting and talking to a lot of like founders, advisors, and mentors is that a lot of us actually have a solid framework for evaluating what is going to be the best leverage within our business. And the problem is, is that this room needs to be better at this than anyone else. Because if I have you know, 20 million in funding, if I have a million dollars in funding when I'm early on, I don't necessarily need to have the most leverage because I can guess and check my way to success. And when this really hits you in the face is when you're facing some sort of a problem. Because oftentimes what happens is when we are looking at a problem, might not be we're not growing enough, could be an actual support ticket, could be a whole host of things. But what ends up happening is we go through what I like to call the freak out cycle of executive emotion. Do you like that phrase? No? It's like a good band name, I think, too. Anyways. So what happens is a bad thing happens. And let's say it's a reactive situation. Um, there's a huge bug that happened. There's like some bad PR crisis. There's something bad that happens. So what we do is we go, this is important, right? We don't question if it's important. We go, this is important. And what happens from that is we go through what I like to call the reverberation of fuck, right? Which is basically us freaking out. And yes, we might go and fix that problem, but we're sitting there and we're like, ah, right? We're like, how is this person so stupid? Why is this happening, right? But we still need to solve that problem. And so our emotions are like driving us, they're driving us, and all of a sudden what happens is we're like, okay, cool, we're gonna guess and check, right? It might be based on something that we read, right? Like, oh, our pricing's wrong, let's end it in nines and put the most expensive tier on the left. That's gonna solve it, right? Like, we're just gonna guess and check, right? And all of a sudden, it might work, it might not. And let's say it doesn't work. What ends up happening on the second pass of guess and check, especially if months have gone by, is all of a sudden we're like, we're going to fail. Everything is terrible, right? Because all of a sudden, we're facing these like, nightmares. We're not getting the growth. Fear is starting to creep in. You know, your mother's like, what are you doing with your life, right? I get that one a lot. And then all of a sudden, we get guess and check three, four, five, six, seven. And eventually, something probably works, right? Eventually something works, or at least we think it works, right? We put in LinkedIn ads, that worked, it's starting to get us growth, cool. We can check this off at least for now. But the issue with this type of thinking isn't that, hey, you're losing time, which is definitely a problem when you're going through multiple guesses and checks. The issue comes in that those initial guesses and checks that you are testing probably have unintended consequences 
that are going to cause you more problems. And then all of a sudden you get into this cycle where you're like, oh man, that problem is now the most important thing. Let's like solve it. And you get into this like world where everything is terrible, even though things are okay or things can be okay, right? Now I'm being mildly dramatic for effect, but this happens on a constant basis within a lot of our businesses. And if you look at like really junior employees, you see this, especially if they, they're driven and want to do a good job. This happens constantly, right? Where you have to kind of sit them down and be like, hey, like a bad support request is going to happen. Let's think through it, right? This happens in small and large situations. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is that the better way to kind of approach this is the breakout cycle of executive emotion. I'm very creative. I don't know. Anyways, so a bad thing happens. And the first thing that you want to do is actually question, is this important, right? Like, is this actually important? Now, if you say no, you don't do anything, you're still going to go through the reverberation of fuck, but it's going to be smaller, right? Because if something bad happens, you're like, hey, it's not important, it's still going to eat at you a little bit, especially if you're a founder because you're like, I want to do a good job. I want this business to be great. I want my team to be great. I want my customers to be happy. But then if it is important, what I think a lot of us, especially when we're facing things that we understand, what we normally do naturally is we live in a world where we first think, we framework what's the right idea, we figure out what that idea is, then we decide on what we should do, and then we act, right? Now, I guarantee you the technological tech, tech founders in the room, the non-business-focused founders in the room, you do this all the time, all day, when you're trying to figure out how to build, trying to figure out how to squash a bug, like this is something that naturally happens. Now, in addition to that, the business-focused founders, if you're working on a partnership, you're trying to do a sales drip campaign, you're trying to do a whole host of things, same thing. You're really, really good at this. The problem comes into play when you get into an emotional place, and all of a sudden you revert back to the previous cycle. Now, the end of this particular cycle of acting, you get into a situation where you monitor and adjust you go back to thinking and acting based on what was good, what was bad. And you still might have those unintended consequences based on what you've done, but you've now lowered the risk of basically being in a position where you were just kind of running around like a chicken with your head cut off trying to solve that particular problem. And so what I want to kind of help with, something that's really unlocked for me for kind of the past 15 years that I picked up um, in a couple of different places, is what can we do to double click on giving you a good framework for some of these problems? Um, and the one I like to talk about is this whole concept of problem, cause, solution. Has anyone heard of this? It's a little bit of root cause analysis. If you studied rhetoric in college, you probably came across this, or if you're a debater back in high school or college. So problem, cause, solution is basically the whole concept of is you can't solve a problem. So if you think about a problem in life, world hunger, gun violence, you know, anything else that's like really crazy, like we can agree that those are problems, but it's really hard to be like, Cool, solve that problem, because that's the symptom of something that's happening, right? What we can solve for are the actual causes within the, the actual problem that's there. So with world hunger or gun violence, you have a bunch of different causes as to why those things are happening. And when you want to develop an actual solution, what you find is that that solution has to go after the cause, right? It's kind of like you can't treat the actual symptom, you have to treat the disease, right? Now what's kind of cool about this is you'll start to discover Okay, some of these causes aren't equal to other causes, right? When we're looking at, hey, we have an issue with lots of accuracy issues, we're going to try to figure out what is the primary cause that doesn't break all the other things that we've done, and how can we figure out how to have the best effect on that problem without having like, more problems pop up, right? And so we use this framework a lot, um, especially with things that are a little bit bigger, like not in a support request necessarily. But we'll actually look at this and we'll be like, all right, we have this problem in the business, or we're faced with a particular problem in HR, for instance, or something that's a little bit more ambiguous to us as we're scaling, and we'll actually map this out, and it's helped immensely. Now, the other thing that's kind of cool, and I'll go through an example here, um, is that this really helped us identify why we should give away ProfitWell for free, as well as where we're going from a vision perspective. Um, so ProfitWell, the, the origin of ProfitWell is, um, I've told it before, but basically we had Price Intelligently and we discovered we didn't have enough leverage with the data that we were collecting. So we were able to help people with their pricing with the so software that we already had. But the issue was is that 
we wanted to help them with bigger and bigger problems or the causes of those problems. And so we determined that we needed more data. We needed to get to the financial data, we needed to get probably to engagement data, and eventually to attribution data as well. And so we were like, this is really exciting. This is the idea we're going to go after. And we didn't really go after it right away because we were looking for, ah, like we're not really completely sure. Um, and then came a day, um, I was in, I can't tell you where because that'll reveal a company, I think. Um, but we were helping a company that was about to IPO with their pricing. And we discovered that they were calculating their MRR and their churn completely incorrectly. And so it was this outside vendor coming in to help them with one thing, discovering that this was a huge problem for this really large company. And so we were like, this is awesome, right? Like, we're going to buy Ferraris. We're going to be so effing rich. It's going to be great. Um, this is back when money was like a big motivator because I was so freaking poor. But what ended up happening is we were like, great, let's get an MVP, right? And this is what the MVP looked like. Um, yes, that is a piggy bank logo in the upper left-hand corner. And yes, when you mouse over that piggy bank, that little coin did drop into the piggy bank. Um, that is Museo Sands. And this is what you get when you hire Patrick to be a designer. I'm just letting you know, OK? Um, and I'm a little insecure just telling you this. So this is what it looks like now. It's great. Awesome. So when you have, when you, uh, you have a design team. The problem was, and this is where the problem popped up. So this is our trajectory for ProfitWell, right? This is our, our ARR under management. Um, late 2013, early 2014, Mr. Pigford showed up, right, with bare metrics, which is really interesting. Then in, uh, like, early 2014, there was a landing page for Chart Mogul, right? Then all of a sudden, you had First Officer. Um, John is amazing, by the way, um, the CEO, founder of First Officer. Then you had 34 other companies that popped up because Stripe, in particular, which is where we all were playing, was basically really, really easy to start the product. Um, and getting it right, going through all the accuracy issues, was, was where a lot of the work happened. Now, to kind of make matters even worse, we're sitting here, and all of this wasn't happening right away. But basically, we had this product. We hadn't really like, publicly like, made a big splash or anything, because we were kind of doing the, we like to call it the, the DC slash Dharmesh Shaw style of building product. But then all of a sudden, Stripe Fund invested 500 grand in bare metrics. And then Chart Mogul at the time, they didn't raise all 4 million um, right away, but they basically were funded as well. So we're sitting there, and we're like, OK, we are definitely not the bell of the ball. No one really knows us. They think we're just pricing. Um, all of a sudden, these products, their first versions looked so much better than ours, had so much like surface area than ours. The two big competitors are funded. and this is what our funding looks like, right? So this is, this is where I'm basically, you know, with, with no savings and making no money living in Boston, which is not a cheap city. Um, and that put me in a nice little reverberation of fuck, right? And so what kept us going, though, is we looked at the space, and we looked at, like, all of BI, right? Not just, like, SaaS metrics and subscription metrics. And one thing that we did, we've always been known to collect data and like go after and like really research the situation. But the one thing that really kept us going is that we did some research where we collected NPS scores from bare metrics customers, chart mogul customers, business, other, and a bunch of other business intelligence products. We went out to their customers and we said, hey, basically asking you know, the recommendation question for NPS, which is measure of customer satisfaction, if anyone's not aware. And anyone guess what the aggregated score was for this kind of BI reporting world? Scale of negative 100 to 100. Any guesses? What? Sorry? I can't see. 40? Any other guesses? Zero. One more? Negative 25. It's negative 15. And we were like, interesting. And our NPS like, wasn't great right, with our little piggy bank MVP, right? So what we did is we're like, all right, we have a problem. And it's actually a pretty me meaty one, right? The distribution and monetization of profit well, it's going to be difficult due to competitive pressure and limited resources. Um, in this market, it appeared, I don't know if you guys remember when all this launching was happening, like Hacker News every other week, like there was just a lot of stuff going on. So we started using problem cost solution. We didn't like know we were doing it perfectly at the time. But in hindsight, it's exactly what we were doing. And we looked at. OK, one of the causes that's going to be difficult is the lack of willingness to pay. So we use some of the resources we have and some of the methodologies to collect willingness to pay data. 
And this was the willingness to pay for a SAS metric solution. This is the data that we actually collected back in 2013, or 2014 potentially right there. And what you'll notice here is that basically you have a low end of $50 per month, a high end of $250 per month, and this is like a high end customer which isn't like an enterprise customer, but we weren't gonna go right after enterprise without any funding. And the problem that you're seeing here, for anyone who understands negative churn, is that basically if I have a big dog, a $250 person basically churn, I gotta have a ton of velocity going from my little dogs up to being a big dog, right? And people just don't move that quickly in terms of their MRR, especially at this low end. And so we're in a situation where there's just like a really low willingness to pay. And we, we see this in most business intelligence and analytics products because they all go up market eventually. And when we looked at it, we actually diagrammed what the actual BI and analytics space looked like. What we found is that all of the energy is being spent on the lower end of this continuum. So we have a ton of DevOps products, a ton of database products working on the data. And then we have a bunch of people who are like, hey, you got a bunch of data, let me give you a shit ton of graphs, right? Give you charts on charts on charts, and that's what we call analytics, right? And what's interesting about that is when you look at most people in the space, they stop at this dotted line, right? Now their marketing talks about insights and outcomes, right? You look at any publicly traded business intelligence product, go to their front page of their website, it will say something like, hey, your customer service rep can get insights on what's going on and pull their own reports, right? Get better business outcomes by looking at graphs, right? They don't say it like that, but that's basically what they're saying, right? And what was really fascinating is we put a couple of different like, feelers out in the field of like, basically like we told people, hey, what if we had this product that did this? What's your willingness to pay? And what we found is that as you get further and further down this continuum, the willingness to pay goes up significantly. So if I solve your churn or part of your churn with retain, you're willing to pay me a lot more than if I just give you an analytics product that has a bunch of graphs, right? And what was also really fascinating is the NPS went up as you went across this continuum. And I think that stands to reason, right? Like a lot of us would figure that that would be true. And we also found, just to be very intellectually honest, that there was a little bit of a dip back at the data side because normally the buyer would turn to a developer for the data side, and essentially those developers really appreciated the efficiency that you would get by using some of these database tools or other DevOps tools. And the other problem that we saw was massive accuracy issues. Um, anyone try to build an analytics product before? Yeah, it's pretty terrible, um, mainly because getting it right and getting it to be accurate is something that's really, really difficult. It's easy to get it like 90 to basically 95% right, but when you're dealing with someone's finances, all of a sudden it's like it has to be deadly accurate or people don't want to use it, especially as they get bigger. And we saw this in some data that we collected. This is a max diff graph. I can send you how to do this if you're not sure how to. But basically we collected data and we found in the second rung here that as a company got bigger, all of a sudden they started to care more and more about accuracy. And the one thing that we had found when we did our competitive NPS is that across the board, not only with our like, direct competitors, but all the, all the other BI products, this was the biggest issue to the operational buyers. The other things that we had, um, very little name recognition, especially for this particular space. Um, not a lot of money, we've kind of hammered that home. And our product was definitely behind. Like the design for something like Bear Metrics or some of the other analytics tools, so much better than ours, especially at the gate, out of the gate. Um, and we were sitting here and, and we would have situations where it was like, we just didn't know what we should do in terms of what features we should build because there were so many different vectors that we could go down in terms of what was important. And so our solution here to kind of you know, gloss over, there's a bunch of other analyses that went into these causes, was, well, if there's a lack of willingness to pay and there's still value in building this, we're gonna give it away for free, right? and we'll show you some data as to why we did that as well. We're gonna take the hit and focus on accuracy until it's good. And that took us 18 months to two years because we, didn't just, we weren't able to just take like, oh, the invoice variable inside Stripe. You had to go down to the event level, basically rebuild the profile of the customer and then do that across the entire account, which took a lot of time. We have about 5,000 different Stripe companies on ProfitWell and it's one of those things where 
like we're still finding bugs even after 5,000 uh, because everyone implements Stripe a little bit differently. But we're going to focus on accuracy and we're going to commit to this strategy because basically what we were looking at was if we can get people in on analytics, we can then get enough data to understand and, get deserve and show them insights. And then ultimately what we can do is we can build outcome-based products where it's you turn it on, it solves a problem, it pays you money, and then we take a cut of how much we give you. And so the way that we think about it is basically we're going to attack everything up until this dotted line, and that dotted line is probably going to go up a bit, and everything beyond that is free, and then everything on the other side of that line, that's what we're going to actually charge for. Um, so that's how we thought about it. That's how we applied problem, sol problem cause solution. But now I want to give you a little tactical detour. You guys ready for a tactical detour? Yeah. Pumped? It's some data. All right. Let's chat about freemium. So big thing about freemium. It is an acquisition model. It is not a revenue model. A lot of you think it's in pricing. It is not. You need to think about freemium as like a premium ebook. And what I would tell you is that freemium is going to be a part of all of your strategies, plus or minus 20% within the next 10 to 15 years. And the reason for that is the most overused slide in any deck, which is how much competition has basically just increased. Um, the average number of competitors, if you started a, a software company, particularly in SaaS, about five, six years ago, um, you were looking at an average of about three competitors. Today, that average has actually increased to about 12, um, just because it's easy to start, it's hard to grow, but it's easy to start. The other thing about freemium that's a huge advantage, retention is noticeably better. You're looking at the retention for about 150 companies where you're actually looking at customers who converted from free, free trial, or no free. And you'll notice is that freemium, it's noticeably better, especially from the bottom part. And then NPS is also noticeably better. So again, these are customers that converted from free. You'll notice the one year ago chart, those free converted customers are doing noticeably, probably about double the NPS as those folks who converted basically from, from a cold start. Now, the reason for this, without going deep, because it's not a freemium talk, is it gives people time to nurture. Basically, we have people who are using the free version of ProfitWell who have never paid us. We're totally OK with that. We give them a ton of value. But what's funny is that they'll use us for like two years, and then all of a sudden timing, which is such an important part of sales, they'll all of a sudden go, hey, we got to fix pricing now. Who should we talk to? Oh, yeah, we should talk to those ProfitWell folks. Like, we feel bad not paying them. Like, they feel bad because we're offering up this, this value. So at least we get the conversation. And a lot of those people then end up paying us something. Um, if you want to learn more about freemium, I wrote the freemium manifesto, profitable.com slash freemium. It's about a 100-page book, a lot of value in there if you want to go deep on freemium. All right, you guys ready for truth? Again, I don't know if you're fired up. All right, do I need to be like, stand up and let's clap? No? Okay, cool. All right, let's talk about truth. So I want to take a step back, and I'm going to do a little experiment on you, okay? I'm going to show you a couple prompts. And all of these prompts I have data for. I have data to support exactly what I'm saying. And it's good data. I'm not lying with any of these prompts. But what I want you to do is I want you to register your emotional response to the things that I'm about to say. So the first thing, I have data that shows that founders who sleep less than five hours a night, they grow slower than those who sleep seven to eight hours per night. They're companies, not themselves. Most people are full grown <laughs> by the time they founded a company, right? Right? This is a pretty easy one to agree with, right? Like, I don't even really need to show you the data. Like, some of you are like, I want to see the data, Patrick, and that's cool. But you're probably like, yeah, this is easy to agree with. Now, the next thing, what if I told you that companies with institutional funding have higher churn rates than those who are bootstrapped? And here's the data. Every second line is the bootstrapped part of the cohort. Every first line is the institutional funded one. Notice how crazy the difference in churn, right? Now that's pretty easy to tell you, right? Some of you not only are like, yeah, I get it. Totally makes sense. But you're also kind of happy about it, right? Because you're all bootstrappers, right? We're all bootstrappers and we're like, yeah, fuck those VCs, right? <laughs> Which is not really how we should feel. Because again, the binary VC versus not always ends on, it's a tool for what you need, right? Let's try another one. 
Founders with hobbies and who score high on a work-life balance index have slower growing companies. There's the data, founders who have hobbies, those who have hobbies are the dark green, those without hobbies, the light green. Work-life balance, folks who scored high on work-life balance, the dark green, light green is those who score low on work-life balance. That one's a little harder to agree to, right? Now you're like, did you include this in that data? Did you account for that thing in this data? Like all of a sudden you're like, I don't believe Patrick. Patrick doesn't know what he's talking about, right? I need my side projects, right? And then finally, remote companies have considerably worse growth and worse retention than co-located ones. There's the growth data. 20% less growth than those folks who are co-located. Now you want to murder me, right? Because <laughs> most of you are remote, right? This is interesting. And the reason that this is interesting is you're all basically going after the backfire effect. You had no problem questioning me as a source when it was something that you agreed with and it hit your core beliefs. All of a sudden, I started to poke holes in your core beliefs. Same data, same source. I didn't futz with it at all. And now all of a sudden, you're like, yeah, your data set doesn't include this, and that doesn't make sense, and you have an agenda, and like all these bad things, right? Now, the backfire effect is basically when something supports our view, we don't question it. If something attacks our view, we feel attacked. They've actually studied this. If there was a bear up here, and it was attacking me, the same part of my brain would go off if you attacked one of my core beliefs with data or some other point of view the same piece of information, basically, to my brain. But that's terrible if you're a founder, right? And it doesn't mean you should question everything in a very assholic manner, right? But it does mean you should be a little bit better and a little bit more conscious of if something is attacking you and if you should actually accept it or if you should learn a little bit more in a nicer manner, not in a, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about way, right? And I think that this really comes down to the emotions of what we perceive and what we know to actually build a business. And I think what a lot of us do is we don't pursue the actual truth of what is right or what is wrong on a number of different axes. Instead, what ends up happening is we go with what we know, we end up building what we know, and if you've ever hired someone who you're a little unsure about, and all of a sudden they found out, oh, they're just doing the same thing that they did at the previous company, they're not approaching that particular problem at your company or at their company at that point with the same level of rigor that they should be, right? And so there's a couple of tactics on how to actually pursue truth here. Um, the first one that I really, really love is this concept called the most charitable interpretation principle. Who here has heard of that? The basic concept is when someone pisses you off, you're going to start overreacting, right? All of a sudden, you're going to go, Oh my God, Patrick, you don't know what you're talking about. Remote is awesome. There's all these trade-offs with remote. Maybe the data says that, but it's going to be better eventually and all that other stuff, right? Instead, what you should do is go, okay, let's assume the other person is competent with good intentions and assume they might be right, right? This was literally the biggest unlock for me in the past 12 to 18 months. It made me so much more zen than I am and so much more patient. Because someone would come to me and I'd be frantic and I'd be like, oh, we have this problem, we have this problem. And I'd be like, okay, hold on a second. Like, this person's not an idiot. Why are they saying this? Let me learn. And if you've ever had a conversation where someone came to you, they said something and you got really pissed off and like you argued. And then all of a sudden at the end of the conversation, you got to a point where you're like, oh, I actually agree with what you were going to say now that I understand what you're going to say. Like, you're not using the most charitable interpretation principle. Now, the other thing that I find really useful, and this is what I put, picked up when working at NSA, um, was working on red teams. Anyone know what red teams are? If you're in cybersecurity, you're pen testing, you're aware of these. Um, the basic concept is when you have an idea, particularly a big decision, you should be red teaming that idea um, pretty aggressively. And what that means is, is you're trying to figure out, you're trying to f it's used in like, both combat and intelligence as well as cybersecurity. You're basically trying to figure out where the holes in the argument are or where the holes in the actual like, enemy are in this particular case. Um, and a big principle that we have at ProfitWell is you want to be disagreeable and think critically, mainly because we have all these ideas coming and all of these ideas that may be good or may be bad, 
but we want to make sure that we're actually thinking critically through those ideas. And the only way that we can do that is if we red team those particular ideas. And I do this sometimes even with support requests. I'll sit in, something comes in, and I'll be like, assume the most charitable interpretation. And then all of a sudden, I'll go into a little hole, and I'll be like, oh, crap, what do I need to do here? This is the best idea. This is what I did last time. I'll think through, still think through two other scenarios in order to basically attack, hey, is this the best idea still? Um, the process, basically have the idea, think through a bunch of different scenarios, and then ultimately make a decision. And oftentimes, what you find in war games is that all of these different red team scenarios, you may not actually use those scenarios going forward, but they actually make the final idea that you work on that much better. Cool? All right. Here's an example of Frothwell that I am very uncomfortable sharing. Um, just to preface if I get a little like shaky. Um, so I travel a ton, um, traveling about 170, 200,000 miles a year because enterprise software fans. Um, and so what that means is, is like sometimes I'm away from you know, my family, which is my partner Jenny and our dog Sloan. Um, so I was away for a while. We had a really, really good weekend. It was October 29th, Monday morning. Um, we woke up about 5.36. It was like a tip, it was a cool morning, like we got coffee, all that kind of fun stuff, which we normally don't get to do in the morning because we're both like running around. Um, so we just ate breakfast. I just got out of the shower, just hanging out. And I read this on Twitter. So CEO of Chart Mogul, looking at reviews on G2 Crowd and Captera, basically found something that definitely looked bad. Um, there was a situation where you know, someone was basically doing multiple reviews. They gave us some positive reviews. They were able to find it, and they were able to trace it back to the negative reviews that they gave to Chartmogul. And you went to the LinkedIn profile of the person, and it looked real suspicious, real terrible. Um, and then about an hour later, Josh jumps in and basically says, this is not friendly competition. These guys are really unethical, low class insanity. And so, fuck, happy Monday. It's gonna be a great day. And again, what I wanna do is go full fucking Braveheart <laughs> and be like, fuck you guys. I have emailed you, I've tried to be nice. You could have emailed me. I could have solved the problem for you. I'm a pretty nice guy, I'm from fucking Wisconsin. Like, we're like black labs of people. Like, we're just like so fun, and so nice, right? But like, no, we gotta like do this on Twitter. And like, I don't know. It was one of those things where like I was just like, just fired up. And then Kristoff from Point Nine, who's like a legit investor, is like, he jumps in, like adds fuel to the fire. Like, I'm just watching the likes and watching the responses. And then like the, the kick in the face was like, there's two people who I like, went so out of my way to help with pricing on a pro bono basis. And they're just jumping in like, yeah, ProfitWell's trash, like blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, fuck, okay? And so what I actually did is I looked at the problem. The reviews definitely look fake, right? Um, Twitter and there's a public issues. There's relationships with these competitors. You wanna have a good relationship, I feel, with your competitors. I think it's important. And there's a perception to our users and our customers, right? Um, and what really just like, really kicked, also kicked in the face was like, these reviews, like there's 100 visits to that page like a month. Like G2 Crowd kept trying to sell us stuff and we're like, there's no, no one goes to this page. So like, it doesn't make sense, right? So I do an investigation, right? I go in, I ask everyone internal. I interviewed everyone at the company, even our Argentinian crew who like, you know, the English is great, but it's not like great always written. So it's like, they're probably not the case. I deep interviewed everyone that like was even remotely close or people who weren't in the marketing team that could have been this. Like some, sometimes you have hoorah rah engineers or salespeople or stuff that aren't tied to this kind of stuff. Um, I walked into every interview basically being like, hey, like you're guilty, right? Like I wasn't aggressive, but I was like, you're guilty. Like, let me make sure you're guilty, right? That kind of a thing. Um, and then when external, um, we had a couple of partners that weren't related to this, but like were remotely related, like marketing partners. Um, I emailed them, I was like, hey, I gotta get on the phone with you, something came up. Interview them, interview them, interview them, um, nothing. Um, and then I went to, we had this like 
we tried to do some affiliate marketing like a year and a half ago, and I couldn't get a hold of this guy, but, and that's like the best place where I think something happened. Um, I don't know yet, it's, and it's really hard to like disprove a negative, right? And so I basically did the due diligence looking for the causes, and I couldn't find like a good cause or a good like, hey, we did this. And so what I ended up doing as a solution is I basically went out, I contacted G2 Crowd and Captera, like I was the one to contact them, which is really funny to me. Um, I said, listen, you gotta do an audit of the entire, um, the entire category, which they both did. It took about two weeks. Um, we all lost reviews, we all lost positive reviews, we all lost negative reviews. Um, I went in and I made it clear to the team, I was like, hey, I, I, we did not find the culprit, but just to be super crystal clear, this is not acceptable. I didn't tweet anything, I controlled the emotions, because it just was like, I got a ton of advice from people I was texting, and like most of them were like, don't respond, because it's just, there's no nuance on Twitter. Um, I handled anyone who came in, um, and basically like, we had a couple of people email in and were like, hey, I don't want to like, be a part of a company that does stuff like this, like what's going on? I gave them everything, like all the information. And then finally I wrote both Josh and Nick separate emails, um, two page emails that basically were like, listen, we don't want to win this way. I did this investigation, I contacted these folks. They're doing an audit of the entire reviews, blah, 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 blah. On the unethical part, like, I don't know what you're referring to. We've had a debate about competitive ads with you before. We don't think they're unethical, you do. But if there's anything else that we've done in the past that we're not doing, please contact me, because I'd like to apologize for it. Or if there's something we're continuing to do, please let us know, because we will stop doing it. And for better or for worse, that was it, right? And this was like a terrible situation that I hope none of you have to go through. Um, and it sucks, but it was one of those things that if we didn't have some of these frameworks, like if I didn't assume that these two guys are trying to protect their company and if I saw this, I would be just as pissed as them, I probably would have went full William Wallace, right? Like I would have been like, fuck these guys, right? But instead I was like, they're trying to protect the company. This looks super crappy. I would probably do something different, but I, who am I to judge what they're going to do? And it caused us to be very, very rational of finding the truth, going after the truth, and understanding what the truth needed to be. And with that, who's ready for enough, another tactical detour? Right? Cool? Ah, oh, some claps. That's great. Um, so we've all heard this. Speaking of competitors, don't focus on your competitors, right? Who's heard that? Yeah, focus on the customer, right? Which is definitely important and definitely should be number one. But that advice started coming out of the woodwork before this existed, right? I have to use the most overused slide multiple times to really get it over, over your heads, right? Um, this is that data that I reference in terms of the rise of competitors. Um, this is in their first year of business, and this has got even worse. But here's some funny data. Those companies that have a competitive-focused marketing strategy, their CAC is lower. All CAC's going up but it's noticeably lower, it's about 20% lower, which is super, super interesting. And this is why in like certain markets, things like competitive ads, competitive pages, these types of things actually work really, really well. Now for some of you who are like, yes, but don't go too far, I don't wanna do that, here's some evidence to support you. This is the NPS of companies that have a competitive product strategy versus those who don't. And notice that the NPS for the product side is actually much lower for those individuals who have a competitive product strategy. And so what I would say in particular is that on the marketing side, you have to kind of judge your market. We hear about the, those two, um, Barometrics and Chartmogul, all the time. We, ha we put them on our pricing page for a long time because we were like, hey, you're, you're already looking at them or you should know about them because you're gonna find them. So here's like extra research that actually worked out really well. Um, we do ads, particularly on the accuracy issue, because we're, I would argue, the one company that's figured that out. Um, and so what happens is we get a lot of people who turn off them to us because of the accuracy, especially our target customers there. But I wouldn't use it for product. You gotta focus on the customer. Cool? All right, last point, I'm going over. I promise to go quickly. Xander's gonna murder me, it's gonna be great. Okay, let's talk about fear. Who here has been scared in their business? Who here has not been scared? That's right, because they would have to get the fuck out, right? Okay, all right, fear, fear is a part of life, right? Like fear is a part of life, it's part of being human. It actually is a really, really good thing, right? 
But when this thing comes up, this like freak out cycle, and you're never going to be 100%. There's things I still freak out about. What you kind of want to minimize is not necessarily the freak out cycle. You want to minimize the reverberation of fuck, right? And the reason that you want to do that is because there's a lot of fear that's going to happen. And it's going to come from a lot of different places. There's good fear. Basically, you want to do a good job. You want to make someone in your life proud, right? There's like lukewarm fear, which is like, hey, my parents think I'm insane because I left like a job I'll never get fired from from the government. You know, then going to Google and working at one of the best places to work to a customized jewelry company, which was the first startup I worked at, to starting my own thing, right? And so they're like, yeah, are you unemployed now? Is that what you're talking about, right? And then there's like really bad places that fear comes from. And this is like, you know, I, unfortunately I had like, it's not unfortunate, but I had like a seven year relationship that didn't work out. Um, and she was in grad school for when I was starting the company and like her friends, like, I don't know, grad school I learned is like spring break for adults. Like, it's like they go out Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and maybe Sunday, right? And I am not that. Like Chris Savage dragged me to a David Copperfield show last night. And I was like, I maybe just want to hang out in my room alone. Like, it's just kind of my style. Um, but the, the, the reason I tell you about the ex-girlfriend is the friends would always judge me because I wouldn't go out. I wasn't fun like that. And it was because I was sitting there and I was like, I have 10 people. If I don't do this thing, they're not going to get their paychecks. And that's like more important than like getting drunk and that kind of thing. Um, and then you have acts of God in the universe, right? There's a lot of places where this fear can come from because there's these things that are kind of attacking you. And to give you some context, this is the graph I showed before um, on kind of where we are. This is the whole company. This is subscription revenue. And so we had revenue from 2012 to about 2016 there, but we didn't have like subscription revenue, right? Um, and we were doing okay, but during this whole time, um, I had a lot of first-time founder woes. Any like first-time founders? Yeah, and you remember your first time as well. Um, I could not have founded ProfitWell in a worse way. Um, first thing I did, um, and it was terrible. Um, Part-time co-founders, anyone do that before? If you're not both or all three of you or four of you part-time, it's terrible. Um, I was the full-time founder. Um, we had part-time founders. It's not that it can't work, but it has a really low success rate. I have some data on that if you want to see it. Um, it does get worse though. Uh, the next thing is my part-time co-founders, they were fully vested and I was not. Um, when the head of product at HubSpot and the local CTO want to start a company with you, you're like, okay, like I'll do whatever, right? That's cool, awesome. Gets worse. Um, both part-time co-founders had more equity than I did um, and they could basically vote me out or do anything um, that they wanted even though they were part-time. Gets worse. The lawyer we had, sister-in-law of the most paranoid of the two. <sighs> and then finally, we had very little alignment on anything, right? Um, did not date my founder, co-founders long enough. Um, they never worked full-time at the company. And, and I, I know, like, again, most charitable interpretation, like these guys had never founded a company either. We all were like, yeah, let's not worry about the legal stuff. Let's not worry about all this stuff because like everything's gonna be great. Like everything's gonna be fine and we'll all like trust each other, right? Um, so I had to dig myself out of that hole over that entire timeline um, and everything's fixed now and they're still involved in the company and we're in a really good emotional place, but I had to threaten to tank the company a number of times because they had equity and it's like, there's, there's nothing you can do if they're fully vested. You're just sitting there and you're like, how do I like move an immovable object, right? I had the breakup in here. Um, I had the reddest of oceans. Um, just to give you some context, I referred to this before, but like imagine you're in a world where you're working on features that are really, really important. The accuracy piece here that we were talking about with the metrics, it's really important and you know that this is the future and you know this is what you need to do and you know that curve is somewhere down the line. Imagine you know that, but every damn day you get a support email or you get an email that's like, well, Bear Metrics has this chart. You don't have that chart. We're like, yeah, but the chart's wrong. I don't care, they have the chart and it looks pretty, right? And you're like, okay. Or like HubSpot was on ProfitWell and they were like, yeah, we're gonna go spend 500 grand plus five engineers full time to buy Looker. Um, and we're like, okay, <laughs> like, great, that's fun. Um, and then the, the biggest you know, kick in the face, um, God, the universe, whomever came in and um, 
I, I've had, and he basically gave me cancer, um, which is like the most blunt way I feel like I could say that. I don't know. Like clearly a little nerve-wracking. Um, that's why I came out a little aggressive. But um, second time, this is, at this point in time, um, this is the second time um, I had cancer. First time I was at Google, which if you're going to get sick, get a job at Google. It's amazing. Um, my manager was like, hey, do you just like not want to come in? And I was like, uh, like, do I still get paid? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, well, how long? He's like, I don't know, like four or six months. And I was like, I'm okay. <laughs> like, I'll come into work. And I, I worked through the whole thing. But that was back in like 2011. Um, and I was like four to six months from finally being in remission. And it was just like, ah, uh, it was such like a kick. Um, but thankfully, like I get tested a lot. Um, and so they caught it really, really early and everything's fine now. I'm not technically in remission, but everything's good. Um, oh, thank you. That's cool. Um, but, like, just imagine all that, right? And it's not a contest, right? Like, you have your own shitty things in your life. Like, it, it, it's, it might not be this dramatic, might not be this many Lifetime movies that you've gone through, but it's like one of those things where, like, you faced something like this, and you might be like, yeah, but it's smaller. But, like, again, like, you know, it's, it's all relative, right? And I think what's really interesting is we go through so much shit trying to build a company. We go through so much anxiety. We go through so much fear. And we try to do it alone. And then when we talk to people, you know what people tell us to do? You should meditate. <laughs> right? Yeah, you should really meditate. Do you ever read, read Atomic Habits? You should really meditate. Bro, you got to work out. You got to eat well. That's going to solve all your problems. Do you journal? <laughs> you got your five-minute journal, right? And all these things are great. All these things help. But you're treating the symptoms and being mildly preventative. The only thing that got me through that time, and yes, during most of the time, it was just reactionary. It was like, ah, I got to go to treatment. I got to do this. I got to do that, right? Like, I wasn't thinking of this. But the big thing that got me through this, at least in my opinion and in hindsight, was really the why in God's name I was putting myself through all that. What was the why of what I was trying to get to? And to me, it was, it was truth. Like I wanted to build something great. I want to build something great. And I want it to be awesome. And I want it to be awesome for our customers and our users. And I know that sounds a little trite, but literally, I treat the world as a fucking math problem, and I was like, the math problem isn't solved yet. And so every bad day, I used some of these tactics. I got a little bit better, and I think that what a lot of you need to do is you need to understand your why. And I disagree with some of the other speakers because I don't think it can be something like, you know, hey, I want a really good, you know, salary for my family. I don't think it can be things like on that level, not because those things aren't important, but because there's so much better ways to make a good salary for your family, right? You gotta have a why at the center of your company, at the center of your product. And then you also have to understand what do you want to achieve? If it is just that salary, if it is just that you know, good lifestyle, 20 hours a week, whatever it is, that's awesome. But you have to know thyself. And I think what a lot of us end up doing is we get really, really frustrated because we want the billion dollar exit, or we want the $10 million company, or we want to be Jason Fried, or we want to be Chris Savage. And then we're like doing, we're not willing to do all of that work. We're not willing to do those things. And then we have all this dissonance that's sitting on both sides in between these things, where all of a sudden we're like, well, why isn't it happening? And know thyself was a really, really big thing for me because I was able to figure out it wasn't money, it wasn't any of these things, it was I wanted to build something great. And then what I ended up doing is I made sure I found partners after going through a bunch of hell who were on the same page. They wanted to do the things that I wanted to do. And then I made sure that our team was on board and I was very selective in like basically who we should hire. And then I made sure that I found a partner and I found friends who respected what I was trying to do. Because any time the fear tried to get in here, and any time it actually did, all of a sudden I had this whole support system around me, everyone who was on the same wavelength who got it, and were able to basically pick me up or at least be like, 
hey, this other thing that you're not working on actually is going well. The mission is advancing, right? Which is a great place to be in. And to kind of break this down, it's really being introspective on where you should be going and what you want. You want to make sure you consume all the advice in the world about that direction. And I think the piece that a lot of us miss out on is being unapologetic. I want to build a big fucking company and I don't want to apologize for it. That's the thing that I think about. Ready for a detour? Yeah? All right. To bring this home so Xander doesn't murder me, as Patio 11 said, you should be writing to and speaking with your team five to 10x more than you're doing right now. Um, we found this out, especially if you're scaling. I wish we started doing this when we were 10 people, not when we were 50. Um, but it's super, super important. And what we do is when we have some big thing, like our principles, which are like our values and our mission, um, and even like our, our equivalent of like the shareholders letter, what we end up doing is we make sure there's multiple versions for it. So we have a narrative, which is like 10 pages long, it goes into all the different idiosyncrasies of things so people can read it. That also has a summary. We have a presentation, which is like a 10 slide deck. And then we also have some media where we do either video or actual internal podcasts so people can consume this in many, many different ways. And then the last thing we do, which I think a lot of you don't end up doing with some of your reports, is we actually test them. So that doesn't mean like, hey, if you get this wrong, you're fired. But it's just like, hey, what did you get from this? What do you think of this? To make sure that everyone's on the same page. The other thing that we do is we try to do weekly posts in both Slack, and that includes typically a video or some media. Um, that really helps because it just keeps people on the same page. We try to repeat things as many times as possible, especially in the onboarding process so that they get the main things that you should be focused on. The other thing that came out, um, particularly with my first bout of cancer, and it's a little macabre, um, I call them if I die docs. Now, we also call them if you get hit by a bus docs. Um, and I think now we call them command centers because it's a little bit more PC. Um, but they're basically, they were Google spreadsheets of every part of the org, we basically structured it in a way where you could basically go in and if you were in this part of the org, you could spend a day or two if you're new to that team and you could get everything, every summary, anything that you needed to get. We're transferring that all over to Notion. Um, and then what we did recently with our ops and finance folks is we said, prep the company for sale. Um, so I learned this like tactic from like a big COO in Boston. Like it's not that we're selling, it's that basically when you tell someone prep the company for sale, what they do is they'll go find all of the terrible things. Like they'll get all the contracts in order, they'll make sure all the employment agreements are set up, and they basically get this into a really good position that if we were gonna sell or if we were gonna raise money or something like that, we we're in a really, really good place. Make sense? Cool. So leverage, truth, and fear. I hope everyone learned something. Um, if you didn't, come find me because I want to make sure I provided some value. But the thing that I'll leave you with, um, you are quite certainly your own champion and your own enemy. And what I mean by that is you control your destiny. Yes, there's luck and there's things that might come in and just like hit you in the face and do a whole host of things. But the thing that you got to remember is that there's so much more in your control. You just have to take ownership of it and when you take ownership of it, that's where you can actually change it and you can make it better. Whenever I meet a founder who's miserable, that's the first thing I talk to them about, which is there's all this stuff happening, but you control where you are. And if you can't, you gotta find the right people around you who can help you basically get good reins on your horses. Cool? Email address, PC at ProfitWell. Any questions on pricing and all that kind of fun stuff? Um, if you want the data decks that I normally do, happy to send those over. But I'll be there tonight. Appreciate it, guys.